I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We just want to begin by praising the Lord that we are here. Amen. We thank God you all realize that January is over already. The year is moving. So we want to see more of God so that we have a lot to tell this year. Amen. 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 You know, as uh, preachers, or at least me, I'm used to saying, tell the person next to you, I realize it's a risky thing to ask in this day and time. So say to yourself, <laughs> the Lord is God. The Lord is God. And I am safe in his hands. The Lord is God. The Lord is God. And I am safe in his hands. And I am safe in his hands. Father, we pray this morning that you would lead us and guide us. We pray for hearts that are malleable, hearts that are hearts of flesh and not of stone. That as we hear your word, we will know what pertains to us. And we will place ourselves in your hands. Because there we are safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we want to have a conversation around the issue of transformation. Or to begin a conversation around the issues of transformation. We spoke a lot about the intimacy of God. Uh, towards the end of last year, quite a lot concerning the issue of intimacy. How we need to walk with God. Mufundisi took us through the issue of fruitfulness. Which is, by the way, a direct result of intimacy. When you are walking intimately with God, you will be fruitful because God's grace is covering you. And that was a powerful session. And as we, as I looked at the issue of transformation, because we've got three issues this year that we are walking in when we say, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Intimacy, transformation, and maturity. To see the new thing that God is doing as he takes us through those processes and allows our eyes to open. All those three are sisters to behold. They are sisters to behold. When you walk intimately with God, you're able to see the things of God. When God transforms you, you're able both to see and move in the things of God. When you reach a level of maturity, you're able to see, to move, and be established in the things of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we want to just begin a bit on the issue of uh, transformation. It's a vast area. But we trust the Lord will help us. Now, if you are going to begin to walk a journey of transformation, one thing has to happen. And that thing is called trust. There has to be trust. You have to trust God. If God is to transform you, you've got to feel safe in his hands. So that as he transforms you, he may ask for fundamental changes to who you are. Fundamental changes to your worldview. Fundamental changes to the lenses through which you see life. Transformation by its nature changes from one state to another. Transformation hits at the very core of who we are because we are built up over years of different issues and influences to be who we are. And when we trust God to transform us, he repatterns us to the pattern he has always intended for us. So it's an issue of trust. There has to be a high level of trust. So this morning, I'm asking you to trust God because you are safe in his hands. So when you hear something and your spirit aligns with it, but you're not sure about it or, or you're unhappy about it or it changes the core of who you are, please this morning, trust God. Trust God. Trust God. Amen. And the step one of this transformation journey, we'll be doing it quite a number of months you know, so we'll talk about it, talk about other things, go back to it, talk about other things to allow for it to sink. Amen. But it's a process God will take us through. So step one 
which is all I'll do today, is forget the former things. Forget the former things. Even fruitfulness is affected if you don't forget the former things. Intimacy with God can be strongly affected if you don't forget the former things. So step one of transformation, forget the former things. Now, Isaiah 43, 18 to the first part of verse 19 speaks about this. And I want to read it from three different versions just to establish the issues we are going to discuss this morning. And it says in the NKJV, it says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. So the word behold there is linking what God has spoken about in verse 18 to what he is going to talk about in verse 19. It says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. When we read it from the New Living Translation, it says it in a very different way, but gives some clarity there that I want to pick on. It says, but forget all that, all the preceding things, all the things that have occurred, all the things that I have known of. He says, forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. For I am about to do something new. I'll read that again. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. For I am about to do something new. So we can hear here a greater clarity coming out here. Is the reason why God wants you to forget the former things is that the things he's about to do will cause those things to pale in comparison. And yet if you don't forget them, you may fail to see the, the, the glory of God in the new things to the extent that God has released. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. So he's saying, I've done great things. Maybe I've been through difficult paths. But all of that, forget it. Because compared to what I'm about to do. And when you look at verse 19, in the beginning of this, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Then he says, it's springing forth. It's coming forth already. And then he says, can you not see it? Amen. It's about the glory, the power of God. And then the second part of it is dealing with where that past is difficulty. He says, no, 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 I'll make a way through it. And rivers of living waters and waters representing life. And he says, I will give you back life. Don't worry about that. Then in the Message Bible, it says, forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert be present. I'm about to do something brand new. This is absolutely powerful. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history, good or bad. It says, and then it gives the instruction. Be alert to the what? To the new. And then it says, be present. Oh, this is so powerful. So it's possible to be in the present, but, but be past. That's a frightening thought. It's possible to be in 2022, but you are living in 1985. Zimbabwe doesn't need an illustration of that. We know it. We have experienced it. You are in 2021, but you are living in 1987, in 1975, in 1963. So the instruction says, be alert so that once I see what God is doing, I can see it and say, that's the hand of God. And then says, be present so that you can also fully experience that new. May the dear Lord help us. It's a frightening thought to think that I might be in this year, but I'm living in the past, so I'm able to partake of the new. Now, there are four issues we want to discuss under forget the former things that pertain to the transformation that God is giving us. And what we're going to do is to explain certain conditions which pertain to former things so that God can help us to transition and be able to see the power of God in the present. 
So the first one of the things we want to look under, forget the former things, is get rid of the Egyptian mindset. Get rid of the Egyptian mindset. Get rid of the Egyptian mindset. So you may be wondering, what's the Egyptian mindset? Don't worry, it will be very clear just now. Get rid of the Egyptian mindset. Now, the cornerstone of the Egyptian mindset is its form or type of lordship. Its form or type of lordship. To give it some background, the children of Israel became slaves in Egypt when there arose a pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And so, for hundreds of years, at least more than about 300 years of, of, of age, what the Israelites knew as Lord was Pharaoh. Those that they knew as masters were Egyptians. So the mindset of the Israelites, when you spoke of lordship, they realized that that Lord, that Lord, that Lord was an Egyptian. That's why when Moses came and he's speaking about God, they ask him, what is his name? Because <laughs> if you acknowledge someone, you know their name is name. By their name, you acknowledge them. But they didn't know God. Whom they saw as Lord and Master was Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And therefore, the Egyptian system. So what they were cultured in, what they understood, and what they saw with their own eyes was this lordship of the Egyptians. This lordship of Pharaoh. This lordship of the Egyptians was not just control or influence. It wasn't just that they controlled the Israelites because they were their masters or they influenced them with their culture. But it was a lordship of ownership. This is very important. The Egyptians owned the Israelites, the children of Israel. So it wasn't just about control and influence. They owned. So the, 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 the slaves were the property of Pharaoh. They were his property. There was an ownership issue. Friends, I put it to you that the slave master owns you, body, mind, and soul. The slave master owns you, body, mind, and soul. Sometimes it's difficult for this generation to understand. But when you, when you have to understand how slavery was, the owner of a slave even used to put a mark the way you know, you know how we brand cattle. They used to brand people the same way and say, I own this one. Even in some of the biblical references, when he's talking about punishment, when you injure or kill someone, when it's a slave, even the Bible says, if you knock out the teeth of a slave, you don't need to, 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 to compensate for that because it's your property. It's only on the matter of life that God always, always wanted compensation slave or not, because life belongs to him. So, when we talk about ownership here or the Egyptian mentality, you must understand that as a slave, you were owned. The master owned you body, mind, and soul. This mindset, therefore, is not about what influences you or what controls you, but is a strong bearing on worship because what owns you is your object of worship. So, the Egyptian mentality it's not about influences. It's not about what controls you. It's really about ownership. What owns you? Because whatever owns you is the idol of your life. Whatever owns you is what you worship. We must realize that the Egyptian king Pharaoh was, the, was regarded as a son of gods. So he was a demigod. He himself was divine. Pharaoh was divine. That's why Pharaoh normally was expected to marry his own sister to sustain the divinity. So Pharaoh was regarded as a divine king. And so when Moses went to ask that the Israelites would go away, the children of Israel would go and worship God, it was a direct affront to Pharaoh. 
Because Moses was saying, you are not God. We have a God. You must understand the contestation here. So when Pharaoh was hardening his heart, it was a matter of worship. Not just an economic issue. It was a matter of worship because if Pharaoh allows this group of people to go away and to worship their God, it means that it upsets the Egyptian way of doing things because Pharaoh is acknowledging there is another God greater than him. By that release. And so his heart was hardened because matters here that were at stake were matters of worship. Friends, I put it to you that when the enemy has got a hold over you, whether it's a hold of sin, a hold of habit, a hold of certain tendencies, you must understand that because he owns you through that hold, he has no intention to let you go because it's a matter of worship. When he releases you or allows you to walk away from that issue, it means you have changed your worship pattern. You have changed whom you are worshiping. The Egyptian mentality says, no matter what you call yourself, no matter who you may be, no matter your history or where you come from, you belong to the masters of Egypt. That's the Egyptian mentality. And so... We see that in Exodus chapter 7 to 9, there's a big contestation going on. And initially, Pharaoh's own magicians are even able to duplicate the miracles of Moses. This shows you that this was no, <laughs> this was no game about economic issues, slaves as an economic issue. This was a worship issue. This was a spiritual battle. And they tried spiritual to spiritual. When we are walking in a season like this, behold, I'm doing a new thing. It's a spiritual battle. The enemy does not want you to experience the new thing. We are in a spiritual contestation. When he went, Moses, all he did was to ask to go and worship his God. But they responded with spiritual power because they understood what was at stake. When we are in a season like this and God is saying, I want to walk with you in intimacy, the enemy is well aware what's at stake. What's at stake is an issue of worship. Whom shall you worship? Whom shall you follow? When God comes and says it's about transformation, meaning you want to change from being more self-centered to being more Jesus-centered, the enemy understands it's a spiritual contestation. It cannot be described in any other way. So Moses rocks up before Pharaoh, and to show the power of his God, he drops. Aaron's rod is dropped onto the ground, and what happens? It turns into a serpent. Immediately they understand what the game is about. It's a spiritual contestation. And they do, they drop their rods and they become snakes. But God being God, he just has one more demonstration and he eats up their snakes. It's a spiritual contestation. And because Pharaoh, though he's called demigod, he's probably not as spiritual as the priests. Do you realize that I think it must have been by the fourth plague, they tell him, this is nothing but the hand of God. They realize earlier than Pharaoh, because it's a spiritual contestation. Friends, if God is going to change you, you must understand that it's a spiritual contestation. The Egyptian, Egyptian mindset, if not discarded, will without fail continue to own you. It will determine your actions, your choices, and the pattern of life to follow. Because the Egyptian mindset does not know how to operate in little bits and pieces. It only understands ownership. I want you to really understand this. So when there are things that we are not putting enough effort to overcome in our lives so that we are fully and wholly owned by God, Friends, those things, you think it's a small part of your life. But the enemy, he says, it gives me license to your whole life. Because the Egyptian mindset does not understand in part. The Egyptian mindset understands ownership. 
That's why when you open the gate for an enemy, you, you know, they say you open an inch and it takes the whole thing because he doesn't understand bits. The Egyptian mentality doesn't operate in control and influence. <laughs> it does that to entice you. But once it has you, it understands ownership. That's why Christ would say, you can save two masters. You can't say, I'm part of this, I'm part of that, or just a small little part. So, one of the first things we need to do on forgetting the former things, friends, is to get rid of the Egyptian mindset. This is why the Lord God speaks of Israel as his purchased possession. <laughs> Amen. So, it's not only about ownership to the Egyptians, it's also about ownership to God. Even in, in, in Isaiah 43, verse 1, that chapter we're talking about, in verse 1, he, he declares and he says, you are mine. In Psalm 74, verse 2, it says, Psalm 74, verse 2, it says, Remember your congregation which you have purchased of old, the tribe of your inheritance which you have redeemed, this Mount Zion where you have dwelt. He says, remember your congregation which you have purchased Purchasing is equal to ownership. When you buy something, it becomes yours, isn't it? Even if it belongs to another person, even if it's a second-hand car. Once I buy it, I have the right to go and re-register it in my name. So even to God, the issue is about ownership. So let me put it clearly. Friends, as far as the enemy is concerned, it's about ownership. As far as God is concerned, it's about ownership. Trust me, there is no middle line. This is a contestation of ownership. In Jeremiah 32, verse 38, it says, They shall be my people, and I'll be their God. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. A central part of the New Testament is our being purchased by the blood of Jesus. Acts 20, verse 28. So guard yourselves and God's people, Feed and shepherd God's flock. His church purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. These words are being spoken to leaders, but listen to the critical aspect. The Lord is saying, look after carefully because they don't belong to you. They are mine. And then he, he states the right of why God's church is his. He says, I have, God's church has been purchased by the blood of Jesus. So because we had sinned, the enemy lay a claim before us. Amen? And there is a thing called the justice of God. God is just. He's even just with the enemy. For as long as the enemy had rights over us, God had to allow the enemy to do what he does. Because he had rights. So in order to cancel those rights, <laughs> the handwriting written against us, in order to cancel it, the Lord Jesus went and paid for it. It had to be redeemed by a payment because it's a game of ownership. It's an issue of ownership. Who owns you? So even though God created you, he, he, the ownership shifted when you sinned because, in other words, you chose, you moved your loyalty from the one who created you to the devil. So in order for, for that ownership to return to God... <laughs> It, you had to be bought again. Why? Because in the spirit realm, it matters who owns you. They can do to you as they will. They can brand on you their name. They can brand on you who they are. They can brand on you their characteristic. It will control your decisions. It will control the lenses through which you see the world. That's why the children of Israel, when they were redeemed from, from, uh, from, from Egypt, they were not changed within. The physical body was free, but the mind was still an Egyptian mindset. It was still in slavery. That's why they could not understand tomorrow, choosing rather to worry about today only. That is why the children of Israel would cry for vegetables. They would even cry for, for Egyptian graves because that was the mindset. And you know when you're a slave, all you do is to complain so that the master does something, isn't it? 
And you know those guys knew how to complain. Everywhere they went, they knew how to complain. The Egyptian mentality was still over them. Friends, this is why renewal of the mind is such a critical part of transformation. Because who owns you pat patterns you. So when you come to know God, you are purchased by God, but you have to be repatterned to the mind of the Lord and to know God. The Egyptian mentality we've been talking about, it allows you to worship God under its terms and conditions. It allows you to worship God under its terms and conditions. But it's about ownership, right? It owns you, so it, it, it will control how far you do any other activity. So if you're still owned by the Egyptians, in other words, if your mind is still accepting the lordship of Egypt, it only allows you to worship God under its terms and conditions. Why? To ensure that its stranglehold on you is maintained. To put it in plain words, you can sacrifice to God as long as you remain under the jurisdiction of that mentality. Let me explain it to you. After a while and the pressure was mounting, Pharaoh then says, okay, you can worship your God, but worship him here. <laughs> Did you hear that? You can worship your God, but worship him here. So in other words, worship him. Go and sacrifice a few animals to him, but remain under my jurisdiction. Remain under my ownership. Go and little, do a little bit of praise and worship, a little bit of raising of hands, but this habit, <laughs> eh? you keep. Eh? Go to the prayer meeting, you know. Um, get excited or join the cell group. But this habit, no, th th this one you keep. Determining the conditions of how far you go in your worship. In other words, in Shona, they would say, Tamba, Tamba, Chidembo, Muskwenda, Gara, say, Dakabat. Get excited about this Christianity thing, but don't deepen in it. Get excited about this Christianity thing, but don't grow in it. Get excited about this Christianity thing, but don't get transformed. So Pharaoh says, to show, in the, I'm, 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 as you can see, I'm always just opposing with the time when the Israelites were in Egypt so that we fully understand. So Pharaoh, what he does, he says, he then changes from saying worship here, and then he says, okay, let men only go. Exodus 10, verse 8 to 10. Okay, he says, let the men only go. <laughs> huh? He's still determining how far you worship. So he says, no, 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 let the men only go. In fact, he says, do you think I'm crazy? That I would allow you to go with the children because the children are the future. Hey. So he says, do you think I'll let you go with the children? Never. Send the men only. It also, Pharaoh also wanted to determine the place of worship. We've talked about that. And how long you would worship God. But he says, go for so long and then return. Friends, don't allow the Egyptian mentality to determine how far you worship God. Don't allow you, the old place where you were slave to various things to control you. Don't allow ancestral worship to determine where you worship God and where they remain in power. Don't allow fear to determine how far you go in trusting God and how far you should not go. Don't allow past experience to begin to direct you as to how much of the new thing you see because beyond that is too far than what it wants you to go. Don't allow the Egyptian mentality to control you. It robs you of vision. It robs you of vision. The Egyptian mentality, it robs you of vision. Especially these three things. Hope, calling, and mission. Hope, calling, and mission. If you are a slave, you don't think about tomorrow. You are just happy to survive today. You have no hope. Calling, 
Well, your, your calling is clear from birth. You're a slave. So there's no need to pray about what's my calling. <laughs> when you're a slave, born a slave, you are a slave. And mission, there is no mission that's there except to save the will of the master that is over you. You live for the day and are unwilling to sacrifice today for tomorrow. When you live for the day, you don't want to do things that may endanger today because you are not thinking of tomorrow. Okay. This is in the realm of Esau. When you allow the Egyptian mentality to continue in you, where you are a slave to something else other than the Lord, if you allow that to continue in you, you will not know, you won't have a proper value system in your life, like Esau. So Esau did a very vile thing. He exchanged his birthright for a morsel of food. So we read in Genesis 25, 32, it says, following this example of Esau, uh, sorry, I'm not going to read it. You can actually look at it yourself, but here's the part of it. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? Ah. I am dying of starvation. What good is my birthright to me now? Okay, we look at it and we say Esau was crazy. Well, can I put it in plain language, in today's language? Okay, I'm dying of desire. What good is it to wait for tomorrow? Maybe we can understand that language a little bit better. I'm tired of not being successful. What good is it not to steal? What good is it not to commit fraud? Because today I should be living better. Why wait for tomorrow? You see, the Bible tells us that Esau, though he sought for the recovery of the birthright with much tears and all, it was done. Why Esau had no future of the mindset. He didn't think of tomorrow. That's what an Egyptian mindset does. It, it says to you, live for today like a slave. Because tomorrow does not belong to you, it belongs to the master. Amen? So it is very critical for us. To understand, friends, that there are some things more important. Now, a profane person, oh, well, okay, let's look at Hebrews 12, 16. It gives us an in-depth analysis of the same situation and says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Now, the word profane person is described as characterized by irreverence or contempt for God or sacred principles. Now, this is a secular dictionary. It's saying <laughs> that a profane person is characterized by irreverence or contempt for God or sacred principles. Friends, so when we really nearly trample on the principles of God, we are behaving like Esau. Do you know how strong that is? When we willingly trample on the principles of God, we are selling our birthright. Because in keeping them, we are assured of the inheritance. In not keeping them, we lose the inheritance. <laughs> May God help us. If we are to behold the new thing, we must be a people that understand that there are some things more important than the pleasure of today. There are some things more important than the possession of, of goods and trinkets today. There are some things more important today that I can even change my decision, which appears foolish for the sake of securing tomorrow. Then we are free of the Egyptian mindset. We need to understand the principle of delayed gratification in this issue. Friends, we need to understand that the grace of God has come to rescue us from this. The grace of God has come to deliver us from this. Hebrews 10, verse 34 to 39, and we read, For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, 
knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourself in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which is great reward. For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to petition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now, a very quick breakdown of the scriptures we've had. It says the Paul is in chains and he's saying they were prepared to align themselves with him even though it resulted in loss physically of goods and everything because they were aligning themselves with a prisoner who the institutions were not happy with. So though there was a risk of loss, for the sake of the eternal vision Paul had, they were prepared to risk and lose and stand with Paul. Are we prepared to risk and lose and stand with the gospel? Are we prepared to risk and lose and stand in mission for God? So where God stands, sends me, I remember I was sent by God and I do not go there and subject myself to the Egyptian mentality of that place. I go there and stand for the principles of God even if the end result is lost for me. Physical loss for me. So they were in that situation. And he says, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. It's very clear. Knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourself in heaven. Amen. Are we prepared, friends, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the will of God, to stand on the purposes of God, to be on mission and do what God is sending us to do, and say no to the Egyptian mentality, no to control by any other power and sector, and say, I will stand for God even if the cost is high. Even if it leads to the plundering of my goods, I will stand for the gospel. Then you know you have been transformed from the Egyptian mentality to the mind of God. Then you will behold the new thing. Because we say the new thing demands. <laughs> it demands the living of the past. So I won't be afraid to lose my goods because I gained my goods in the past, but there is a future where goods greater than what I have gained. Hallelujah. You have to have that mentality if you are going to be ready to give up the past. You've got to say, I will stand with God because what he has in store for me is greater than anything I have seen behind. When you understand that, you can walk away from anything. When you understand that, you can leave the past. When you understand that, you can lay and risk everything in your life. Why? Because God... God is greater. God is more powerful. God is more loving. God is more caring. He will do for you greater than anything you have seen in the past. Ask Job. Ask Job and he will tell you everything is better in the aftermath of the troubles. When you stand for God. When you stand for God. Ask Peter. He will tell you. When you are all forgiven and you have managed to stand and you rise up and you say, I'll be bold. And when the Spirit of the Lord has come, I'll be the first to speak about Jesus. His boldness is returned and he received greater than what he tried to save by denying Christ. Friends. And he says, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This is very important. This is very, 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 very important. The word of God says, the just shall live by faith. That's where we like to stop. We love that phrase. We, we say it, we declare it, we shout it. And I know Pentecostals, you jump this high when you're in prayer. The just shall live by faith. But it doesn't, look. It's true, the just shall live by faith. And then it says, but if anyone draws back. So there's a possibility, friends. <laughs> when you're still under the Egyptian mentality. That you will fail to live by faith. You look at the situations they are. And they say, the only way I can survive. Is if I do this wrong thing. The only way I can succeed. Is if I do this wrong thing. 
But when you understand the principle that says the just shall live by faith, this principle says no matter what comes my way, I will triumph. No matter what comes my way, my God will see me through. Living by faith, friends, says that there will be no obstacle too great for me to follow God. And when you're in that place, God is able to show you great things because he's delighted in you. When you don't stand in that place, the Bible says, I have no pleasure in anyone who draws back. And then verse 39, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Believing in God. Get rid of the Egyptian mentality, friends. Get rid of the Egyptian mentality. Get rid of the Egyptian mentality because it keeps you bound. It keeps you bound. I'm not going to go to end. I'll finish next week, the rest of the things, but this was the most critical that we had. Friends, I want you to understand this truth and strongly hold on to that truth. Our Lord God has purchased us by his blood. Therefore, he owns us. That's why he's able to give you a name that only he knows because when he bought you, he put an imprint on you. In fact, the word of God goes on to then say he gave us a guarantee of our salvation, the Holy Spirit. Because as the Holy Spirit works in us and we allow him to work, we are confirmed to whom we belong. Amen? And it is not possible for an Egyptian mindset slavery to another to coexist with your total yielding to God. The two cannot coexist. You will either follow the Egyptian mentality or you will follow God. We see the world through our experiences and where we have come from, through what we have been exposed to and what influences us. And if that is not God, then we are looking through the world wrongly. And when those lenses are not of God, you can't behold. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can't behold. So you'll be saying, they are so excited about this thing, but I don't see. We need to move. We need to move from a certain position. Next week, we even talk about the good. Why you should move away from the good of the past. Amen. Why should we move away from the good of the past? Because when God says, behold, I'm doing a new thing, even the good of the past pales in what the future holds. Amen? So today we have emphasized this thing. Don't be slaved, enslaved by the enemy. He never understands partial. He only understands the whole. In his economy, 10% does not exist. Joint ownership does not exist. Don't mistake your being allowed to do a few excitable Christian things for total freedom. Total freedom comes when I say, Jesus, you alone are the Lord of my life. When we say, search me and see. If there be any error, any wrong way in me. When I yearn for the word of God. When I desire for the times I spend with him. And when things begin to transform in my life. When I begin to change the way I look at life. <laughs> when I begin to change my behavior. When my priority system is beginning to shift. So, here is a challenge in closing. One of the ways of seeing whether one you're still in an Egyptian slavery or not is very simple. What is the thing that is most difficult for you to let go today?
that former thing that is most difficult for you to let go today, the day you'll be able to release it, then you know you've walked away from Egyptian slavery. The mindset of Egypt for the children of Israel was unable to possess the promised land. They failed. Imagine, you have seen the wonders of the ten plagues. You have seen the wonders of the Red Sea. You have seen the wonders of bitter waters becoming sweet. You have seen the wonders of food that rains from heaven. You have seen the, every form of a wonder. And yet, you still see yourself as a grasshopper in the eyes of the enemy. That's why God was so angry there. Because what they were actually declaring is that God, because they were saying God is smaller than the God of the Canaanites. That's what they were saying. But you see, what was speaking there was not the children of Israel as in the promise of Abraham, but the children of Israel enslaved in Egypt. That's the voice that was speaking. In this season, may God be in total control of you so that the big things he wants to do, you can believe for them. So that the big things he wants to do, you can see them and accept that God can do it. So that the way he wants to make a way, a way there is no way. Hallelujah. Imagine packing your bags and doing everything and, 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 and packing your bags, preparing everything, going to get your COVID test. And we ask you, where are you going? And you say, you know, I'm going to the United States of America. And then we ask you and say, where is your visa? And you say, God knows. Then we know that man is under the lordship of Jesus. Amen. Because he has understood the power of God to provide. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Forget the former things. Forget the former things. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Move away from the Egyptian mentality. Hallelujah. Be under the control of the God who is able, the God who is capable, the God who can transform you. And this transformation doesn't matter who you are or how terrible you are. <laughs> Zacchaeus, brothers and sisters, he was a terrible man. A thief of naught. He stole from both the poor and the Romans. Because the Romans didn't know he was doing extra. He was a thief of naught. But he climbs a tree. <laughs> he sees Jesus. Jesus acknowledges him. And he is transformed. How do we know he's transformed? Because money which drove all his actions no longer controlled him. And how do we know money no longer controlled him? Because he says, Master, I'll give four times what I stole. In that statement, Zacchaeus says, Money which caused me to be a fraud is no longer my master. You are my master, so I can dispense of the money. Move your lordship. Can we stand? Move your lordship. Change your lordship. Decide who is the lord of your life. Decide, move from the former things. I don't know who was controlling you. I don't know what was determining your, your viewpoints, your things. I don't know. Some of us, we grew in a life where everything, we used to see, you know, use of, of, of black magic in our lives. And so we think everything, even our approach to Christianity, is more black magic best. May you be free today in the name of Jesus. May God deliver you and rescue you. Some of us, we have hurts and past from the past. Don't let them control you. They too are Egyptian masters. Forgive. 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 Don't allow those Egyptian masters, those hurts from the past to affect you. Some of you, it's failure from the past. That's your Egyptian master. Failure says, try everything. Go and sit, listen to the word, write the notes, but don't believe. Don't have faith for a greater thing. That's what failure says, and it's still speaking today. But in the name of Jesus, be delivered from failure. 
be delivered from failure from the past because there is a God who says, behold, I am doing a new thing. Walk away from that Egyptian slave master. Some of you, it's parents who rejected you and you always have a chip on your shoulder because you were rejected by parents. But today, there is a God who says, when your mother and father forsake you, I will be your mother and your father. And he says today, deliver yourself from that Egyptian master of rejection. Walk away from it in the name of the Lord. That the grace of God will be upon your life. For some of you, you were hurt by friends. You were pained by friends. Friends caused you great harm. Maybe they took something that was dear from you. But the Lord is saying, be free from your friends. Be free from what they did. No longer let that control you. You can trust again. You can trust again. You can, he says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. I will give you the quality of friends that as if Christ himself was your friend here on earth. There is a God who understands friendship. Because he says, I now call you friends. I now call you friends. I don't know what was your Egyptian master. But we need you to walk away today. Because you will not behold the new thing. You will not behold the new fruitfulness. You will not behold the new intimacy. You have to be transformed in this area. Walk away from the Egyptian master. Some of you, it's a certain habit. Friends, habits can be broken. They are not God. They pretend to be God. But there is a God, hallelujah, who by his power and his might, he breaks the habit. So don't let the habit determine where you spend your money. Don't let the habit depends or determine how much time you spend on something. Let not the habit be such a deep craving that even when you want to be in the presence of God, the habit is calling you away from the presence of God. Friend, be free. Be free from that habit. Be free from that habit. Do not allow it to hold you back. And finally, friends, don't allow hopelessness to hold you back don't allow hopelessness to hold you back when you look at the future and you can't see what's good about it when you look at your circumstances and you don't know what's good about it where everything you seems to touch seems to fail like what the prophetic word was saying this morning you try you try and you don't succeed and you're bound by hopelessness in fact hopelessness is now put a limit because when something now comes that can excite you you want to protect yourself by refusing to be excited you refuse the opportunity not because it's not a good opportunity but you are afraid to get hurt be free from hopelessness today. Be free from hopelessness today. As a nation as Zimbabwe, let us declare together, Zimbabwe is free from hopelessness. Zimbabwe is free. From, let's do it loudly. Zimbabwe is free from hopelessness. Why? Because our future is in the Lord our God. And he says, Zimbabwe, behold, I am doing a new thing. He is rising over our land in power and in authority. He is riding from Chirundu to Bridge. He is riding from Mutare to Victoria Falls. And he is declaring, let the banners of Jesus Christ be raised high. Be raised high. For we are children of hope. We are children of hope. And our hope is in our faith. We were purchased by the blood of Jesus. And Jesus will look after us. Jesus will sustain us. Jesus will ensure his mission succeeds. Friends, we are victorious. Hallelujah. We are victorious. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Raise your voice to the Lord. Raise your voice. Just respond to God right now. Some of you are in need of healing this morning. Just talk to your God. Just talk to your God right now. Lay yourself before him. Walk away from that Egyptian master. Walk away from the Egyptian mindset. There is a God who says, forget the former things. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Behold, I am doing a new thing. You are no longer a slave. You are an inheritor of the promised land. You are an inheritor of the promised land. The Lord your God is with you. The Lord your God is with you. Lift your voice to the Lord. Lift your voice to the Lord. Lift your voice to the Lord. Make some declarations this morning. Make some declarations this morning. Choose today. Whom shall you worship? 
Whom shall we, we, you worship? Who will be the Lord of your life? Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand. Let's give the Lord a hand. Let's give the Lord a hand. Come on, saints. Let's give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As the MC is coming up, this week I'll be praying for you. I will be praying for you. And all I ask of you is go before God and get rid of the Egyptian master. The Lord bless you.